Um, so, Catherine, I saw an article, uh, I think it was late last week, around the number of aged care beds that we're going to need in the future and uh, and that we're, we've got a shortfall. Um, so, you've, so how have you come to the being in the interim role for a start, I suppose, of aged care and what is our current situation around beds? Yes, um, certainly when you're looking at any service that um, is targeted at the population, the first thing you do is you look at the population projections. So if I once I looked at the Te Whata Ora Aged Care Demand Planner, um, it was clear to me, as is clear to anybody else who works in aged care, there is going to be a, a, a shortfall of beds, not just by the end of this decade, but out to 2040. If you're looking at the New Zealand population, it's getting older, we're living longer, mm. and particularly for the over 85s, that number is going to triple by 2040. Wow. The disappointing thing is, though, Tina, is that um, Te, Te Whata Ora Health New Zealand and I would say successive governments haven't done a good job in terms of planning to mm. serve that need. Now, not everybody wants to go into residential aged care. It's mm. for the frail and the sick. But there's a really important part of our population that has no other choice. So you want it to be high quality and accessible to all. By 2040, we need about 80,000 beds, but based on Te Whata Ora um, forecasts, we're only going to have about 33,000. Wow, that's a big shortfall. That's huge. And what that means is immense pressure on families, mm. on people, and it's not just out there in the future, it's right now. If you look at um, what's going on in the hut, yep. um, there are frenzied emails, you're trying to find spaces, health officials trying to find spaces, they're not there. The thing that upsets me the most coming new into this, this role is seeing the demise of the charitable sector because mm. over a period of years, there have been a lot of closed doors, mm. a lot of people have looked at the contracts and gone, heck, that we're making losses here, we can't make ends meet. But sadly, health officials don't listen and um, for a lot of them, I think the aged care sector is a bit of an annoyance, but it needs uh, um, a really important focus and it needs sustainable funding. Otherwise, things are going to get a hell of a lot worse. Mm. And, and so, like, it's one of these things that seems to be happening at the moment is this, we're, we're starting to live with, the, I wouldn't call them the crimes, but the mistakes or the focus in the past. And you've sort of hinted at that. This is not just one government's fault. It's a successive um, issue where we haven't, we, we focus on the sort of the here and the nows rather than the planning for the futures. In fact, I can't think of a sector that actually really does plan well for the future. We're not good at it as a nation, really. That's right. And so often, I think, uh, political leaders look at what the electoral cycle is, mm. but in terms of preparing for the population, the older generation coming through, yeah. that requires leadership. That needs someone to stand on the mountaintop and look at those forecasts and say, come on, New Zealand, we've got to get this sorted out. Yeah. And I mean, if you go, if you like, if you're travelling on the train from uh, Wellington to um, the White Rapper, like I do, it looks like the whole of the Hart Valley has become uh, like the series of rest homes. So there is quite a lot of development by big operators. Are we also starting to see a shift from the smaller, more boutique family type operators to these big, large conglomerates? Because that's the only way you can make it work? That's that's exactly what's happening. The small family op operators are finding it incredibly tough. Most of them are making losses, as are uh, those in the charitable sector who provide um, rest home care for those New Zealanders who may be living without other means and just solely relying on their pension. You're quite right. Some of the retirement villages have got uh, care suites and hospitals mm. tacked on because um, many people going into a retirement lifestyle living mm. in those villages, they like the idea of the continuum of care. Mm. But the disturbing thing is, is that some of those villages are saying, look, we're not going to keep building big hospitals for everybody because mm. we're making losses on every single one of those pay those residents. Wow. So they're got, they're, most of them have publicly said they're only going to build enough for their villages. Yeah. And that leaves the rest of New Zealand in a difficult situation. So the point that, that I think... Um, uh, is important as many people think aged care that's just for the uh, the over 80s but mm. actually it affects every single New Zealander because mm. there's a reason 
mm. for hospital waiting lists, problems in, in emergency departments, um, that the aged care sector is part of the health system. Mm. And if you've got older New Zealanders who are in hospital because they've got nowhere else to go, yep. suddenly your hospitals start to look like um, retirement res- homes. Retirement homes, mm. and younger people can't get the operations and the services they want. So it really does affect us all. Mm. And so, uh, 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 what sort of lobbying are you doing in Iraq? Because it's a, a, a ripe time, I suppose, for you as an organisation to be doing some lobbying going into an election cycle. What sort of feedback are you getting from the various parties around the issue? Well, most many of the parties are that they want to talk crime, they want to talk cost of living because of course it shows up in the polling. But all of our interaction is saying to them, look, your policies need to speak to the issue of aged residential care too. Um, e- every party I would hope would have a section on that in their manifestos coming into the election. Mm. It's the right and moral thing to do. Mm. Uh, so certainly we've been having lots and lots of conversations and encouraging them to do that. And I'm I am quite encouraged because quite often political leaders will react to what's happening in the news of the day. But once they see the statistics and they see this tsunami of care need coming our way, um, they they are starting to think, look, we've got to do something about this. Otherwise, otherwise we're we're all, you know, the, the hospital system could be brought to its knees. Yeah. I, I suppose the other thing is too, is what we are... What, what sort of care do we wrap around people? Like my mum, um, she'll be listening, um, is, uh, she, she's 83 um, and uh, she shifted from Carterton to Masterton. She's got her own two-bedroom, little townhouse, very nice. Um, and she's close to town, so she's sort of thinking about, you know, if she lost her licence over the next few years or whatever or can't, couldn't get her licence, um, then at least she's in walking distance to everything or possibly even a mobility scooter, who knows. At the moment, she's in, um, got a full faculty, all good, and um, she's still driving and, 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 and she gets a little bit of support, I think, from the government around gardening and things, and things like that. With the Aged Care Association, you're mainly looking at the institutions who have aged care facilities. Who's actually working with the health system to keep people in their homes as long as possible um, to stop that sort of, or slow the flood, I suppose, of um, the people like mum into that system? I know hopefully she'll never get there, but, um, you know, it is always a possibility. That's a very important point because aged care... It's not just about being in a, in a residential facility. It's how do we in, uh, uh, support a positive care of those in, uh, over the age of 80, wherever they might be. Mm. And the ambition for everybody, I expect, is to want to stay at home mm. as long as they possibly can. And so re- the residential care is for those who cannot live safely at home and mm. support themselves. But you are quite right in that the ambition is to have as many people as possible living positive, positive lives at mm. home, but you have to wrap around them support. And one of the things that I worry, having read numerous uh, strategy documents from health officials in Te Whatuora, is that ageing in place um, can start sounding like it's code for leaving people at home and shutting the door and hiding the problem. So you have to resource things properly, whether that mm. that New Zealander is at home or an aged mm. care facility of some kind. Because it must be cheaper to keep them in their home than it is in an, an aged care facility. Um, surprisingly, uh, no. Mm. But um, it depends on the level of care. Of, right. But I, I would argue that every New Zealander... You know, has a right to appropriate care wherever they may, m- might mm. be to ensure that they ha- they enjoy those last few years. Mm. And, it, and it gets pretty difficult for some and for the families who don't like to see their, their parents mm. um, become frail and sick and not able to cope. Yeah. And... And so, um, like, you've, you've laid it all out to all the government departments, all government um, various parties, and uh, you're starting to get into the media around making some noises around this. Uh, are you really expecting any change in terms of attitudes towards the provision of care and, uh, and a strategy to deal with this um, rising tsunami of need? It's one of those issues where all involved have to keep talking about it and keep raising the issues. Uh, it, it, th- 
things won't change in terms of the way contracts are funded until a minister and a government mm. and a cabinet says, look, this just isn't working. But things are going to, unfortunately, I think, get a lot worse before they realise that change needs to happen. So I'll give you one example. Um, there, uh, for many New Zealanders who rely solely on a pension, they might um, end up in what is known as a standard standard room in a residential facility. There hasn't been a new standard room affordable just on the pension built in the last 10 years. Most, wow. Most of the closures have been standard rooms. Oh, my Because most of the new ones, of course, are being built by the retirement villages and their premium new mm. rooms with extra payments. Yeah. So there is going to be a sh shortage. There is already a crisis in some pockets of New Zealand, mm. um, the Wellington area, for example, and, and others. What about Auckland? Uh, Auckland, Auckland, um, with the rising property market, mm. um, given the way aged care is currently funded, almost doing anything else with your land is mm. more profitable than having a, an aged care facility. And mm. so if you look at the newspapers uh, and online on a daily basis, you will see certain things. You'll be, see stories about closures, and I know there are a number, a number of um, providers who are just teetering on the brink and likely to close mm. um, this year. You see stories about um, waiting times in emergency departments, patients in corridors. Mm. They're all linked yep. because the aged care part is is starting to clog the system because you can't get patients through because there are people, for no fault of their own, mm. blocking beds yeah. for other sorts of health treatments. Yeah, that's really sad. So um, if you're rich, it's okay. <laughs> That is one thing that troubles me as a as a citizen, not yeah. just as a CEO of the Aged Care Association, but I'm I, I see a two tier system that mm. is developing, and it is a very un -New, un New Zealand thing to happen mm. because that you know when you look at that cradle to grave promise since the 30s, you want every New Zealander to have the option of high quality care wherever they might be, mm. and I think eventually New Zealanders will will. We'll all get that, but it's the stress and the anxiety of finding a space for mm. families. And, you know, it may not even be in your own town and region. I where know, you grew yes, up. yes. And that's, yes. that is very upsetting for older New Zealanders when they're having to shift towns for the yep. first time in their life. Or uh, in the situation of one of my friends, uh, parents in different facilities because one facility can't have both of them because they're at different levels of care. Um, and, and so the, the ones that are more high needs than the other. Um, and so you've got the separation of partners, and that's not unusual, I understand. And um, for, for many couples, that's heartbreaking for them, but um, certainly if you're looking at the sorts of aged care, there's going to be a real shortage of dementia mm. um, beds and also the, the, the new trend of psychogeriatric beds, mm. um, psych psychogeriatric care where some people, uh, they're not themselves mm. anymore and they're aggressive and hard to manage mm. and um, need more secure facilities. Those are the beds no one's got building. And and it's not just our sector um, complaining about the contract rates. The banks are saying to providers, we're not going to like, we're not going to lend money to you mm. because your your loan doesn't stack up. You can't actually pay mm. back the the loan and the principal. Yeah, and I, I I don't know whether you noticed it out on the street here in Wellington. I've, I've, I've um I know Ruby's had issues in the past out here in Manners Street, but most of the homeless are old too. Um, they're not young, and and so they've got nowhere to go. You you're so right around the fact that there isn't that provision for that um, lower cost care for those sort of people. That is one of the most disturbing trends. You're going to see more and more uh, people living on the streets in the over 65 age bracket mm. because they have nowhere to go for other reasons. You see, the aged care funding at the moment assumes that most New Zealanders go through life, own a home, sell it to fund their, their mm. later years. But we're seeing lower home ownership mm. and that's, that's you know, adding, adding to the crisis. Mm. So one government, <laughs> a government in the future one way or the other is going to have to deal with this because families and New Zealanders and citizens are going to start screaming pretty soon.
Yeah. Oh well, I can imagine. I mean, I, and as I said, we're, we're, we've seen it here in the in the in the platform, and I just noticed this morning, and I thought because I knew you were coming on, and I just looked at them, and I thought these people are all old, you know, and it must be hard for them living on the streets because oh, it's bloody hard enough for me living in a really cool house with really good, <laughs> beautiful fire and stuff. You know, the old arthritis starts to stick in, and I thought, how are they coping? You know, it must be incredibly physically hard for them. Um, and I couldn't live on a, I can live in a sleeping bag in a tent, no problem. But uh, you it, living like last night, the weather here last night. If you're over sixty and you're living on the street like those people are, it's just they're going to die. They're actually going to die. That's the that's the guts of it. It's, you know, it, there are parts. I mean, it's been a real privilege to to have a window into the the wider aged care sector, and I see um, you know the quality of care for those who need that care is really high because, of course, it's all um, led by registered nurses mm. uh, who, by the way, were left out of the pay equity se- know. segment. I know. What was that about? I and saw that last night too and I thought, well, that's not very bloody fair. And uh, if we look at the number of beds that were closed last year, it was about 1,200 or so. And some of that was because we couldn't just get nurses um, because, of course, if you're working in aged care, you can be earning many, many thousands of dollars less than in the public hospital system. So market signals matter. And mm. so we, I was really pleased to see the Nurses Association come out and say, look, we won't rest until mm. this pay equity settlement is for the aged care nurses and for nurses and GPs. Yeah. Um, Offices as well. Yeah, and I, it was interesting because I think the highlight they hi- were, were in, in the Waipareta Trust. I think the story was that I saw. Um, so it's affecting um, it's affecting those clinics as well, um, which are uh, a new breed of healthcare. I think um, we're seeing the emergence of that, where the Maori run, Maori focus, but for everyone. Um, and and they were the same. Those nurses and those and those institutions were also missed out of of Makes the pay. No sense. It Makes doesn't doesn't. It's just really bad. It's that second. It's, you're right. There's so many examples at the moment of where we've got this sort of tick and tear thing going on in society. Um, yeah, I don't know about you, but you know, and you've come from the grocery trade, but by crikey, it's bloody hard at the supermarket these days as well. <laughs> and and that's one of the things that has a, a impacted the cost of aged care because um, you know. You, you've got to feed people, feed people well. You know, f- um, f- uh, fruit and vegetables going up twenty mm. percent. Mm. All food, building costs, insurance, wages, and you know, I think the strategy for Te Whara Ora is just to slap on, you know, a three per- three to five percent increase and say, you know, be grateful for that. But mm. it's it's not enough. So mm. f- providers are closing their doors. And you only want, you know, another thousand or so beds closed. And hello, these people need that support um, for acute health needs. They're going to go to the hospital. Yeah. They're going to, you know, continue blocking beds so Kiwis can't get the other health treatments they demand. Yeah. And and just the uh, one thing I just uh, want to touch on, and we've talked about the rise of the larger, bigger institutions. Uh, are they funded offshore or are they New Zealand-based, most of the big ones? There's a mix. Right. And um, the, Who's our biggest supplier? Uh, if you look at... Um, th- th- there's a mix and the, some of the companies are the likes of Ryman, Oceania, MetLife, etc. Yep. And this is where I think many, pe- many people in health officialdom uh, make, make mistakes because they assume that the retirement villages, which is lifestyle living for the, mm. for the for active seniors, is the same as aged care. Now, m- many, age, m- many and most aged care providers aren't attached to a village at all. Right. And so while some of the retirement villages can cross-subsidise their hospital care, if you're a mum and dad operation or if you're the likes of Presbyterian support or... Mm. A, a other charity, you can't do that. You know, mm. you you have to live on the measly contracts that don't cover costs. People are really surprised when I say to them that if you sign up to a Tefato or a contract to provide the service, you know, at best you'll break even, but more likely than not, you will be making losses. Wow. So I've spoken to providers that um, uh, some have not, and the smaller facilities have not drawn a wage for themselves for two years. Crikey. Um, uh, heard um, one woman who was a nurse uh, staying in a caravan on the property because she couldn't get registered nurse to s- stay over, and again, it it is really hand to mouth, and it's and it's mm. not good enough. Mm. Um, 
uh, you know, the government regularly part funds contracts and expects the provider to make up the rest. Well, you know, these are core government services. Yeah. So um, market signals matter, and the pricing signal sent by Te Whata Ora contracts at the moment is get out of town, do something else, sell mm. up, yeah. sell the land. And that's why, why you're seeing regular stories uh, where aged um, uh, residential aged care facilities are closing or they've sold, and you know, the, mm. the property developers are going in and making town, you know, building town townhouses. Houses. Yeah. And that's the loss to the community. Yeah, and the increase of the uh, tsunami. Hey, look, uh, Catherine, that uh, was a really, really interesting um, interview. I, uh, I, yeah, I think I've learnt lots around, uh, you know, the funding issues. Um, and it certainly sounds like it's something that <laughs> among the many myriad of um, big ticket things that we've just got to come to grips with when, rather than the small stuff. Um, which we seem to focus on these days. Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, because and it does affect not just our, our parents and our grandparents, but as I say to people, if you're over over the age of 55, we're talking about us. That's right. It's <laughs> us. It is us. Yeah. And, you know, and I've got a couple of people in my orbit are early Alzheimer's, early onset Alzheimer's, which is becoming it's more... very hard. Yeah. And, and, um, and they're looking at how they can access early care because... They know they've only maybe got 18 months, two years to um, function before they're going to need some significant help. That's tough. And it's a definite, it's another rising issue that's coming at us. Yes. Uh, and we, we can do better as a nation. The, the, the current two-tier system for haves and have-nots that's being developed, mm. that, that, that officials are allowing to entrench, uh, is very un-New Zealand. We yep. want every single New Zealander to live each decade of their life with dig dignity and respect. Mm. And um, on that note, uh, uh, thank you very much again uh, for coming into the studio, Catherine.